All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, it's great to see everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, welcome to mock oral scenarios for the general surgery certifying exam hosted by the SSAT Resident and Fellow Education Committee. We are super excited for this session um, and absolutely thrilled for our panel of expert invited examiners and examinees. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and participation. Um, I think in particular for the examinees, it is not easy to do mock orals in this forum, so thank you for stepping up. Um, my name is Linda Q. I have been an assistant professor of surgery for exactly 20 days. I'm at Michigan State University after finishing my surgical oncology fellowship this summer. Um, my esteemed co-moderator is Dr. Raja Narayan, who is a second year surgical oncology fellow at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School, and just could not have asked for a better partner in crime for organizing this session. So thanks, Raja. Uh, we're both members of the SSAT Resident and Fellow Education Committee, which is chaired by our fearless leader, Dr. Maria Altieri, uh, and vice chaired by the one and only Dr. Zeevan Fong. So our schedule of events for the evening, I have four quick intro slides about the SSAT, which I'll sail through because we wanna get to the scenarios. Um, we have eight cases to go through, 10 minutes each, followed by a Q&A at the end. So, some of you may not know that the SSAT was founded in 1960 at the Association for Colon Surgery. Um, I didn't. And the mission is to lead in advancing the science and practice of gastrointestinal surgery involving a global community of surgeons, um, advancing research, innovation, and advocacy to benefit patient care. These are the membership categories and fees. You can be an active candidate or medical student member. Um, I'm not sure if there are any medical students here. You would be highly advanced if you were, but um, just to know that $20 is just a one-time fee, and then you can register right on the SSAT website. Benefits of membership are a subscription to the Society Journal, the Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery, discounted registration to DDW, and access to all kinds of awards, grants, scholarships, and leadership opportunities. So to learn more, please visit the Residence Corner. Um, at ssat.com slash residence. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Narayan and just going to ask um, that attendees turn your video off and that each examiner and examinee turn your video on during your case. That way you're front and center. <laughs> um, okay, Raj, I take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Q. So I have the pleasure of introducing our first pair. So that examiner will be Dr. Motaz Kadan. He is the Gapontsev Family Endowed Chair in Surgical Oncology and Deputy Clinical Director for the MGH Cancer Center, specializing in hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery. He completed his general surgery residency at Stanford and Surgical Oncology Fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He will be examining Dr. Kristen Jogers, who is a clinical and education surgery chief resident at the Massachusetts General Hospital. After completion of her residency training, Dr. Jogers will begin her surgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson. Dr. Kadan, why don't you take it away? All right. Hi there, Kristen. Good evening. All right. So um, uh, basically, I'm going to ask you some questions here, and I just want you to answer um, like you would in any kind of clinical scenario or tumor board. Uh, so we're going to begin with a case of a 55-year-old man, uh, let's say, who presents with uh, dysphagia that has been uh, progressively worsening more to solids than to liquids um, and has been associated with a 10-pound uh, weight loss that he noted over the last two months. Um, he's otherwise been relatively healthy. There's nothing else he can think of to add to his examination, uh, to, to his history at this point. Um um, on a little bit of questioning, you find out that he's been taking the occasional PPI. He's been smoking for the last 30 years. Uh, he's had a, a history of occasional uh, to mild alcohol consumption. And he says his father died of some kind of cancer, but he doesn't have much more history other than that. And then on examination, you know, a, a thin, cachectic appearing gentleman uh, who has um, otherwise no major abnormalities on examination. Uh, his abdomen is soft and non-tender. Otherwise, there are no major findings besides that. His vitals are normal. You're seeing him in the office. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, that's the majority of what I would ask on a focus, physical and history, uh, looking at those risk factors, given my concern for his uh, dysphagia with uh, red flag symptoms. In addition to palpating his abdomen, I'd also want to feel if he has any evidence of any supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. Um, oh. He does not. Okay. And then I'd also do a DRE to see if there's any pelvic fullness or concern for any um, 
pelvic deposits in case this was an intra-abdominal malignancy. Nothing else on full examination. Okay. Then I would obtain labs, um, including a CBC uh, and CMP, and I would also get uh, imaging with a CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, what do I find on those? Okay. What else are you looking for on the uh, labs? What other uh, labs? Oh, sorry. And then also I would get a um, CA-199 and a CEA. And then I would also get an albumin um, as part of my uh, chemistry to assess for his malnutrition. Okay. So his albumin comes back normal. His LFTs are largely normal as well. CBC reveals a mild anemia. His hemoglobin is down to 11. His CEA is elevated at uh, 10 and his CA-99 is normal. Uh, so what imaging did you want to get? Oh, before that, and then I also would want to get a PTN INR just to see if there's any evidence of liver dysfunction. INR is borderline 1.2. Okay. Yeah. okay. And he's had no prior episodes of GI bleeding before with that mild anemia. Nothing yeah. else. Okay. 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 And then I would um, get a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, multiphase. Okay. So you get a CT um, and the abdomen and pelvis, first of all, you know that there is uh, an appearance of a thickening. Uh, in the proximal stomach on the CT scan um, and uh, some regional adenopathy. There's no evidence of metastatic disease. There's no evidence of ascites and the chest is clear. Okay. Um, and then I would uh, consult my gastroenterology colleagues for an upper endoscopy and possible biopsies. Okay. So the gastroenterology team is all out on a new golf tournament. It's actually out in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in the great weather. So what would you like to do? All right. I would then perform the upper endoscopy myself for uh, biopsies. Um, so I take the patient to the endoscopy suite and uh, place them uh, at um, super, or left lateral position and 60 degrees um, angle. And then uh, using uh, sedation, I would um, put in a bite block with the help of my nurse anesthetist. And then I would insert my um, EGD scope looking at the um, entirety of the esophagus, noting the G, if there's any abnormalities in the GE junction and the distance to the um, incisors. Distance is there any is irregular, is, GE junction is completely normal. Is esophagus normal. is normal. Okay, I would then enter into the uh, stomach and I would take a look around uh, completely, including retroflexion views. Okay, so on retroflexion, you know that there's a four centimeter mass that appears to be about four centimeters away from the GE junction. It looks a little bit oozy and fungating, but it's not actively bleeding. Um, mm -hmm. You obtain a biopsy at this point, and it shows a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. The rest of the exam is unremarkable. What would you like to okay. do? Then? I would then like to complete uh, EUS for um, assessment of the tumor thickness. Okay, so you get an EUS and it confirms regional adenopathy that's positive for cancer mm -hmm. and essentially you know, what you expected. It's a T3N1 cancer. T3N1. Okay, given T3N1, I would discuss this patient at a multidisciplinary uh, conference along with my medical oncology and radiation oncology colleagues for consideration of neoadjuvant chemo radiation before surgery. Okay, so the uh, medical oncologists agree and they uh, put the patient on a flaunt regimen at this point, neoadjuvant. The patient undergoes treatment. Uh, you bring them back to the office um, and uh, you restage them, and it looks like they've had a good response. Uh, mm -hmm. and tumor, there's no evidence of metastatic disease on the CT scans. And I do um, apologize, I forgot to mention that before obviously taking this patient to neoadjuvant uh, multidisciplinary conference, I would um, also recommend that they undergo a staging laparoscopy just to make sure that there's no peritoneal disseminated disease. And at that time, given he has significant dysphagia and appears cachectic on exam, I would consent to him for a laparoscopic J2 placement for J2 feeds preoperatively as well. Okay, noted, and you did exactly that, and that was very good. There's no evidence of M1 disease on the cytology. Okay, okay. what would you do next? Okay, so I've now completed neoadjuvant chemo radiation? Yes. Okay, um, I would then... Adjuvant chemotherapy. Adjuvant, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with my um, uh, medical oncology colleagues. I would then see him back in the clinic um, to assess his preoperative status for consideration of a total yeah. gastrectomy. It looks okay. great. Okay. I would proceed Good. to the OR for a total gastrectomy. All right. Tell me how you do that. All right. So I'd make a midline laparotomy incision. I would again take note of the entire abdomen to see if there's any evidence of disseminated disease. Is there any? No evidence of disseminated okay. disease. I would then mobilize the GE junction, taking a rim of the diaphragmatic cura. I would then uh, mobilize the, um, the omentum along with um, 
along the transverse colon to take it and block. I would then mobilize and do a regional lymphadenoc uh, lymphadenectomy, along, skeletonizing the celiac, the left gastric, and the um, splenic arteries. I would then take the arteries in um, sequence, so first the left gastric, making sure there's no evidence of any accessory or um, abnormal left gastric or left uh, hepatic artery. I would then take the uh, right gastric artery and the gastric epiphloic arteries um, on block. I would then uh, divide at the duodenum pyloric junction and the esophageal junction, and I would send the specimen for frozen pathology to look for margins. Okay, great. You complete the operation. So it looks like Bev is saying that time's up. Um, I was just going to say that that's fine, you know, and the next portion of this case, which would be the stem of this case, is I would say, okay, the patient's in PACU, you get a call from the uh, uh, nurses in the PACU to say that the patient's hypotensive. Can you tell me a few causes of hypotension? And I'd expect you to list that three or four from the abdomen and about three or four from the chest as well. All right. Mm -hmm. And it's just to rattle out the list. Okay. Let, let's just stop there. I, I think that's fine. I, I don't think we need to keep going anymore on the uh, scenario, especially if time's up so we don't bite into other people's time. So mm -hmm. um, overall, um, to me, there is no question about it. This is a passing exam. I, I think you did a great job. Um, I really like the fact that you went back and added something. You are allowed to do that. We are human and it's completely acceptable. I thought you were very thorough. Um, in terms of just some feedback on the case itself, I think you did all the right um, staging stuff. You added in the staging laparoscopy in the last second there as well. New adjuvant chemotherapy would have been uh, um, useful for a, a locally advanced gastric cancer like this. Um, I do think it took a while to get to the operation. Don't forget, this is a surgical exam and I'm trying to kind of like prop you along a little bit. Uh, but basically... Uh, this is not a history and physical investigations exam and a workup. This is a surgical exam. They want you to do an operation. They want you to manage a complication, basically, is what it comes down to, or something along those lines, or, you know, talk about what operation you would do for a list of diagnoses that they give you. And sometimes they just ask you for quick fire rounds. A couple of things I would just add in terms of the feedback. I always tell people, don't forget, this is a tennis game. So, you know, try and be very precise, very short with your answers. You know, I, I would do an X lab. Well, what do I find? Well, you find, let them go and talk, take the next part over. And then you come back and say, okay, in that case, I would do the following, you know, a total gastrectomy with a D2 lymphadenectomy. Okay, good. How do you do? And so there's going to be an exchange and you're really looking for brevity in your answers that are very precise and essentially what they're looking for. Um Choose a path and go with it. You know, sometimes you'll see this in things like breast questions. And I could do a mastectomy and descent on lymph node, or I can do a lumpectomy and radiation. Good, but what would you do? So just choose one and always go with it. Uh, I think you did that in your case very well. Um, it's okay to go back. We discussed this. Um, HNP is given at the beginning. I think most of the time they don't want you to go back and do an HNP. It's a waste of time. But I would say having taken a full history and done a complete physical examination, I would next proceed to the labs. I would just verbalize that. Um, all cases start with either the HNP or with the ABCs if it's a trauma case. Summarize. So try and stop when you hear like everything about the case and you formulated your differential diagnosis. Just take one second up and just say, sounds to me like you're asking me about the case of a locally advanced gastric cancer in this 55-year-old gentleman. The examiners can then take a step back and say, wow, this person knows what they're talking about. We know that they're not going to know how to manage this case. And everybody relaxes and the question basically becomes gears towards a passing question in that way. So these one summary statements sometimes can be very helpful in these cases. Don't forget, relax at this exam. You're the expert, not them, in the sense that they have not just read the books. Actually, they're definitely not the experts. They're not allowed to be the experts. So you're not gonna get a gastric cancer surgeon asking you a gastric cancer question. Uh, and then time goes by fast. It's actually up again. Um, and then I always just, I'm gonna throw in a couple of pearls here. Don't worry about patients. You, you open the patients. You don't have to close them. It's not a real problem. You know, if you have to leave a patient open in this exam, it's fine, you know, for second looks and things like that. And then know every operation in about five steps, I would say. Um, apparently there's a sheet that's going around that I've kind of written in the past about steps of an operation, but that's the most intimidating part of this exam is they may ask you about an operation you haven't seen before. There is no such thing as a hard operation to list that in about five to 10 steps maximum. All right, great job. Well done, Kristen, thank, thank you. you. Awesome. Thank you. That was a fantastic start. And thanks, Bev, for keeping us on track. Um, so we'll move on to scenario two, which is foregut and MIS. And our examiner is Dr. Ryan Day, who is a transplant surgeon and surgical oncologist at Advent Health in Orlando. 
He completed his general surgery residency at Mayo Clinic, Arizona, surgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson, and abdominal transplant fellowship at UCSF. He will be examining Dr. Desmond Hund, who, which is the, who is a first year MIS fellow at the University of Michigan and who completed his general surgery residency at Cedar sinai Dr. Day. All right. Uh, just keep in mind that I'm not trying to trick you. And if you need me to repeat anything or go back, please let me know. A, uh, your scenario is a 52 year old female. She comes to see you uh, in your office. For the last nine months, she has had a progressively worsening symptom of heartburn with occasional food regurgitation. She has burning chest pain after meals and difficulty sleeping when she's lying flat. She takes over the can counter antacids, but they provide temporary relief only. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension controlled on one medication, sleep apnea, but she doesn't use CPAP, and her BMI is 46. She has no prior abdominal surgery, uh, and her physical exam is significant largely for a soft, non-tender, obese abdomen. Her cardiopulmonary exam is normal. She has seen a gastroenterologist who did an EGD, which showed mild erosive esophagitis. H. pylori testing was negative and was seen to have a moderate hiatal hernia. She has basic laboratory tests that are all normal and an EKG that is normal. How would you like to proceed? All right. Well, in this um, uh, patient, it sounds like they're having symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, probably secondary to a hiatal hernia based on our findings. Um, it sounds like I've already completed my history and physical. Um, I'd like to make sure to take any note of any previous abdominal incisions and complete a full surgical history, uh, as well as I'll obtain a set of laboratories, including CBC uh, and uh, Nutrition Labs, LFT, BMP. All of her laboratory examinations are within normal limits. She has no prior uh, abdominal surgical history uh, and no prior incisions on her abdomen. Um, I want to make sure, you know, my first thought is working towards this, uh, the differential as discussed. Uh, I would also want to make sure that at some point she's undergone a cardiac workup to make sure none of these symptoms are uh, cardiopulmonary in nature. But given my main differential is a uh, hiatal hernia, um, my first study I would order is a upper GI series. Okay, on an upper GI uh, series, she has a mild delay in her esophageal emptying and no strictures are seen. Okay, um, uh, and uh, are you able to give me any information on the nature of the hiatal hernia itself? Uh, you don't see much on the uh, upper GI with uh, regards to the hiatal hernia. You see maybe a little bit of the stomach uh, above, but with her elevated BMI of 46, it actually makes the penetration on the study hard to interpret. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, I would um, make sure to review her for um, typical symptoms, so heartburn, uh, regurgitation, um, and uh, dysphagia, uh, which it sounds like she has. Um, but it's in order to confirm the etiology of this uh, uh, reflex symptoms as the hiatal hernia, I'd like to schedule her for a uh, pH testing or Bravo. Okay. She completes a 24-hour pH uh, monitoring. Uh, she has episodes of reflux with pH less than four and an aggregate Demeester score of 17.5. Okay. So it sounds like she is over the um, kind of uh, normal limit for her Demeester score. So based on these findings, it seems that uh, the symptoms are likely uh, secondary to her hiatal hernia. Um, and remind me, uh, what was her BMI? 46. Okay. So our options here are essentially to repair the hiatal hernia in the standard fashion, or kind of in a fund application fashion and uh, coral repair. But because she is also uh, obese, she may be a good candidate for a gastric bypass, um, which would be uh, both an anti-reflux operation and a bariatric operation, giving her the best uh, possibility for success. Okay. Uh, she says that she trusts you and she thinks whatever you would do is best, but she has heard some of her friends say that the uh, bypass procedure is a radical procedure and some of them had sleeve gastrectomies and she wants to know, would that be better for her? Um, so I would counsel her that while the sleeve is a great bariatric operation, um, she has a couple things that would make me hesitant to go for that. Um, some data has suggested that sleeves may, be, um, uh, may induce reflux and make these problems worse. In addition, she has findings already of erosive esophagitis, which means we know her acid problem um, needs to be addressed. 
Uh, the gastric bypass is an operation we've been doing for a long time and is effective at treating both of these problems. So uh, I would recommend her to go down this route um, to kind of address her problem in the best way possible. Okay. She says that sounds good and she's ready to do the operation. And uh, how would you proceed? Uh, I, so I would take her to the operating room um, after making sure that she's medically optimized and ristratified. Uh, I would place her in supine arms out with a flipboard um, and gain abdominal access with a varus needle uh, at Palmer's point. Uh, I then place um, my five uh, trocars in the uh, left upper and left uh, right upper quadrants with a camera roughly 15 centimeters from the xiphoid. Um, I would begin the operation um, by, uh, yeah, I prefer, I'm going to perform this operation in a, um, uh, a mega loop fashion. So I'll start by uh, making my, identifying my limbs. Um, so counting from the ligament of trites, I'm going to make a 75 centimeter BP limb, mark that out with a plan to make about a hundred centimeter rule limb. Um, and then I will proceed to divide the pars, uh, do a perigastric dissection of her stomach, uh, divide the stomach at about four to five centimeters from the G junction and create a pouch over a 34 French bougie. Um, I then transect the stomach and create my pouch. I'd bring up my omega loop where I had marked it, um, anastomose my GJ with a linear fired stapler and a hand sewn um, closure of the common enterotomy. I transect my BP limb at, uh, and bring it down 100 centimeters uh, down my rule limb and uh, perform my uh, jejunostomy in a side-to-side -side, uh, stapled fashion with a hand uh, closure of the uh, common anerotomy uh, sewn. Um, and then make sure to close the uh, mesenteric defect and the Peterson's defect. Okay. Uh, all of that goes well, and she does well in her post-operative period. Six months later, she's lost about 60 pounds and comes back into your office. She's having epigastric and right upper quadrant pain that's lasted for several days. Uh, you admit her to the hospital and a CBC shows a white count of 14,000. Her AST is 300 and her ALT is 240. Her bilirubin is four. And uh, you do an ultrasound that shows gallstones with pericholecystic fluid. How would you proceed? Gotcha. Um, so it sounds like she has a... Um elevated uh, liver function tests, giving me some concern for um, possible cholelithiasis. So I'd uh, obtain uh, starter antibiotics and get an MRCP. Okay, our time is up. Uh, I think you did great with the scenario there. Uh, a couple of things that I would do maybe just a little bit differently as you recapped a lot of what I was saying. Uh, it used to be there were kind of strategies to the oral boards of delaying. Uh, now you get points for the things you do during the uh, examination. So I would try to proceed through the scenario into surgery as quickly as possible. Uh, but you did great with it and you got all the right answers. So good job. All right. Great. So we're going to keep it moving here. Thanks so much. So next, we're going to move on to the endocrine section. So I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Chi-Chi Stuckey. So she is an assistant professor in the Division of Surgical Oncology and Endocrine Surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. She completed her general surgery residency also at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona before attending MD Anderson for her surgical oncology fellowship. She will be examining Dr. Patricia Liu. She's a fourth year general surgery resident at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona and will be applying for endocrine surgery fellowship next year. Take it away, Dr. Stuckey. Hi, Dr. Liu, how are you? I'm good, thank you, how are you? Good, let's jump right in. Today, you have a 43-year-old man who was undergoing a CV carotid IMT, which is basically a carotid ultrasound, um, where he was incidentally noted to have a thyroid nodule in the left side measuring one centimeter. He has no other past medical history um, and he doesn't take any medications. He's pretty healthy. He's never had any surgeries before. So he underwent a dedicated thyroid ultrasound, and that thyroid ultrasound showed a one centimeter nodule in the left lobe that was solid with lobulated margins, and the thyroid score was five. He also had some lymphadenopathy just below the thyroid pole on the left side again, and then some questionable lymph nodes in levels three and four on the left. 
how would you like to proceed? I would um, conduct a focused history and physical, asking about any noted growth in the nodule, any history of head or neck radiation, any family history of thyroid cancer, any noted voice hoarseness, and any prior neck surgery. On exam, I would look for clinical lymphadenopathy and see if I could palpate the nodule. Okay, he doesn't have any history of radiation, no recent voice changes, although he thinks he's been starting to kind of clear his throat more often. He doesn't have any family history of thyroid cancer, um, but his dad actually had died in his 60s pretty randomly, and they just found him dead at home. Um, and he otherwise uh, has no other significant family history. He, when you palpate his thyroid, you definitely feel the nodule. It is mobile, and you definitely feel the lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy on the left side. So based on his exam and his TIRAD score, I um, would want a FNA of the thyroid nodule as well as um, the, uh, the clinically significant lymph nodes on that side. Okay. FNA comes back and both of them are positive for medullary thyroid cancer. How would you like to proceed? Um, with medullary thyroid cancer, you are. I'm concerned for um, MEN. Uh, syndrome, especially given his family history. So I would also want to um, screen for um, um, the associated um, lesions, including uh, for uh, uh, theochromocytoma. Um, so I would ask about hypertension um, and obtain uh, urine metanephrines um, and catecholamines and plasma fractionated metanephrines. Okay. He doesn't have any history of urinary hyper, or sorry, he doesn't have any history of hypertension. His urinary metanephrines um, are two, over 2,000 and his normetanephrines are over 5,000. What would you want to do now? Um, given the elevated values, I am worried that he may have a, a theochromocytoma. Um, so then I would, um, uh, I would request a CT abdomen pelvis to evaluate for any adrenal nodules. Okay, you get the CT and you find that there is a nodule on the right adrenal gland measuring approximately one centimeter in greatest dimension and it's at the inferior pole. Okay, um, and there's nothing on the left adrenal gland? Nothing on the left. Okay. Um, given his um, labs and imaging, um, are both consistent with a, a pheochromocytoma. I would not proceed with treatment of his medullary thyroid cancer until um, the pheochromocytoma is managed. Um, Pre-op, pre um, he would need to have an alpha blockade uh, with um, phenoxybenzamine, as well as um, I'd counsel him on a high sodium diet for volume expansion. And then, and then after a sufficient alpha blockade, then a beta blockade um, prior to surgery. Okay, two things. He says he can't get phenoxybenzamine at his pharmacy, and so he wonders if there's anything else he can do. And then secondly, what would you say is sufficient alpha blockade? Um, he can, there are other um, medications like doxazosin. Um, sufficient alpha blockade would be um, normal tension to like orthostatic hypotension. Sometimes patients have um, even sinus symptoms, that would that would convey to me that they are uh, sufficiently alpha blocked. Okay, he has those. Now what do you want to do? Um, then I would um, proceed to, I would counsel him on, um, I would have counseled him on this earlier about what a pheochromocytoma is and, and the indication for treatment and um, surgery. In his case, I would recommend a laparoscopic right adrenalectomy um, for resection. And this is after alpha blockade only? No, he, this, was, this would be after he then had beta blockade as well. Okay. Can you take us through a right adrenalectomy? Yes. So I would um, position the patient in um, right lateral decubitus uh, with uh, all you know, bony promises padded. I would place my um, 
trochar in the um, one in the umbilicus and then subcostal three in the subcostal um, enter the abdomen um, examine the abdomen mobilize the triangular ligament of the liver to mobilize the right lobe of the liver up identify the ivc um, going up the right side of the ivc until i can identify the right adrenal vein um, dissect and ligate the right renal vein to control it and then using a energy device um, remove all the um, the adrenal gland and the associated retroperitoneal fat from the superior pole of the kidney up to the diaphragm in an on block fashion taking care to not rupture um, the adrenal gland um, during surgery right. I think we'll stop there since we have limited time I thought you did an excellent job with your workup and um, just going through each step of the workup. I don't have a lot of comments as far as the workup is concerned, other than don't forget about the original problem, which was the medullary thyroid cancer. So while you're going ahead and doing the workup for the adrenal gland, there were labs that you would wanna get for the medullary thyroid cancer as well. Um, yeah. But you are right to proceed with the workup of the FIO first. And then my only other thing that I would suggest is when you are describing the adrenalectomy or really any surgery, I don't know how much detail you need to go into regarding um, positioning necessarily, although you could definitely say left lateral decubitus. And then I would usually just try to cut my answers like short or very direct by saying, four port laparoscopic adrenalectomy, mobilize the right triangular ligament, identify the cava, just like you said, go along the cava, um, starting at the right renal vein, um, superiorly to the right adrenal uh, vein, and then so on. But otherwise, I think you did very well. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you, great job. Um, we're gonna move right along and our next topic is breast. Our examiner is Dr. Neha Goyle, who is an associate professor of surgery and the Schulte Endowed Chair in Cancer Research at the University of Miami. She completed her, surgical, her general surgery residency at Columbia and surgical oncology fellowship at Fox Chase Cancer Center. She will be examining Dr. Peter Liu, who is a first year surgical oncology fellow at Jackson Memorial University of Miami who completed his general surgery residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Dr. Goyle, please take it away. Excellent, thank you. Hi, Peter, how are you? Hi, good to see you. Good to see you too. Okay, excellent, so let's begin. So you have a 43-year-old woman that presents, she's premenopausal, who presents with a rapidly growing large right breast mass. She recently gave birth about eight months ago, but is no longer breastfeeding. She says she's sick and tired of this growing mass. She's been to the emergency room almost every two weeks with antibiotics, and they just tell her she has a skin infection. How would you begin? Okay. Um, she's giving me an HPI, so I would move on with uh, investigating more of her history, including ruling out her risk of breast cancer, family history, uh, exposure to hormonal therapy or OCPs. Um, and then following that, I would move on to a physical exam. Okay, excellent. So she basically states in terms of she has no significant risk factors except for a significant family history with breast cancer, um, both in her mother and grandmother, and they were both premenopausal. How would you complete your physical exam? Uh, I'd examine both breasts in the supine and sitting positions, uh, starting clockwise around each breast, feeling for any nodules or masses and masculine those borders. Um, and then I would examine examine her skin for any erythema, and especially in this case, uh, skin dimpling, pot um, and then make sure I investigate for lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy in the axillary, cervicoclavicular, and, and cervical lymphoma basins. Okay, excellent. So you feel on exam a 10 centimeter mass. Um, you notice erythema, pot orange, and matted adenopathy um, in the right axilla, but no other significant findings, what would your next steps be? Uh, based on that exam, I'm concerned for inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, so I would what's, go ahead. And, what specifically makes you concerned about inflammatory breast cancer? 
um, the history of a rapidly growing mass over the last six months and uh, significant erythema and hodorange over a third of your breast. Okay. So I would, I guess, move on to get a screening mammogram, uh, diagnostic mammogram, I'm sorry, ultrasound, and probably ask radiology to go ahead and, and, and go with coronal biopsy. Okay. And but we'll both, the, both the lesion and you mentioned the metanopathy, so both the lesion and the lymphos. Okay. So you go ahead um, and get the diagnostic mammogram. It shows a 10 centimeter mass involving all four quadrants with overlying um, skin edema. The axillary ultrasound also shows enlarged um, multiple um, lymph nodes without a fatty hilum, and they have an abnormal cortex. The biopsy shows intraductal carcinoma, triple negative, and high grade. Um, she sees you back in clinic and is curious about your next steps. Okay, uh, next, I have the stage patient. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, bilateral breast MRIs and, and head to toe PET and CT. Okay, so um, turns out that there isn't any PET scan available in your hospital. What would be any additional staging imaging that you could do? Um, I guess an alternative would be a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and then to rule out bony mats, I would get a bone scan. Okay, so she um, comes back to see you. The MRI is consistent with... Um, imaging that you've already had done showing basically level one um, lymph nodes and a large mass involving the entire breast um, without involvement of the pectoralis major muscle and her CT scan shows no evidence of distant disease. So she's curious about what her next steps will be. Um, I realized I forgot to include labs in, in her staging workup, so I make sure I get labs, including LTs. Uh, but then the next step is I would uh, present this patient at a multidisciplinary committee. Uh, and my recommendation uh, for her at, at the tumor board would be neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and if she responds, we'd get surgery and then post-op radiation. And because she's young, um, under 60, I would also recommend her to go to see a genetics counselor. Okay. So she um, sees genetic counseling. They um, do genetic testing. She doesn't have any um, mutations. Specifically, she does not have a BRCA1 mutation. And then she um, comes back to see you and um, agrees with, with the plan that you've um, discussed in multi-D tumor board. So she's just curious if you can tell her a little bit more about the surgery. Uh, in her case, um, I would recommend a uh, modified radical mastectomy. Okay. And if you, she's curious what that is. So it would be a, uh, essentially a total mastectomy with uh, an axillary lymph node dissection. Okay. And so she's, um, she's curious about what her risks of surgery would be. Uh, as with all surgeries, there's always a risk of infection. There's always a risk of bleeding. Uh, with her, I'd be a counselor of the risk of nerve injury as well as the long thoracic, thoracic dorsal. And then because we're doing axillary node dissection, she has a maybe 20, 30% chance of um, lymphedema in that extreme. Okay. And anything else you would do for her after she comes back to see you after completing neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery? Uh, I would want to re restage her. I would get a repeat uh, breast MRI. Okay, so she sees you back um, near completion of her neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, you've already discussed her surgical plan, but she's um, really happy because her it looks like the disease has, has completely disappeared on her exam and similarly on her MRI. And she says, doctor, you had initially said you wanna do a total mastectomy. Is that still necessary? Um, I've had many friends that had just part of their breast removed. Yeah, I would tell her in this scenario that she has a more aggressive cancer. Um, a lumpectomy would not be offered. I would, unfortunately, she would require the the total mastectomy, uh, and I wouldn't be able to offer her central lymph nodes. I would uh, offer her the uh, complete node dissection. Okay, so she agrees um, to surgery. Please take us through the surgery. Okay, um, I would do a large elliptical incision around the breast, including most of her skin. Uh, start by dissecting flaps, sort of superiorly to the clavicle, medially to the sternum, inferiorly to the IMF, laterally to the latissimus dorsi. I would use that same incision to perform the axillary node dissection, tracing the lat dorsi up to the axillary vein, uh, dissect uh, the lymph nodes from that area, making sure I protect the long thoracic thoracodorsal bundle. Um, and that would be my level one nodes. 
Um, and then to get my level two notes, uh, I would uh, go posterior to the pec minor. Okay. And then leap drains and then close the skin. Okay. So as you're going posterior to pec minor, you notice that you feel some abnormal lymph nodes. Would that change the rest of your surgery at all? Uh, then I would have to proceed to level three to no dissection. Okay. So she does well. Um, and then you see her basically in the post-op visit. She had a complete path CR. She's just curious if there's any other treatment you would offer her. Uh, following this, uh, I would offer post mastectomy radiation. And okay. remind me, she's uh, HR, PR, ER negative. So she, exactly. So her negative. final pathology was triple negative as well. Okay. And then as she's getting up to leave the office, you notice she's just having some difficulty getting up and out of the chair. Um, is there anything that you would be potentially concerned about? Uh, that sounds like I may have caused a nerve injury. So make sure, uh, possibly recommend her physical therapy. Okay, excellent. So I think that's also where um, our time is up, but excellent job. And you really hit all the major high points and we were able to get in um, a, a complication as well. And so I think those are kind of the main things as mentioned earlier, really, it's just going through the steps of the surgery, knowing that if you feel any abnormal um, level two lymph nodes, you can um, go ahead and do a level three dissection as well. Um, once again, with inflammatory breast cancer, you cannot offer um, a lumpectomy, even the, in the setting of a complete um, clinical response, just given the aggressive nature and the um, lymphovascular invasion of the disease. The only things that I would, um, maybe some twists that someone could add in is we could say that she was BRCA1 positive. And so that would, um, you would have to make the decision and discuss with her the risks and benefits of doing a bilateral mastectomy in that, mm -hmm. at that time. Um, similarly, given her age, you could also have that discussion of um, a bilateral, but I wouldn't bring up the discussion on your own because it would just eat up a lot of your time. So it's mainly if she was BRCA1, Similarly, for all oncologic cases, you want to make sure that you bring it to multi-D conference like you did. You want to make sure you do staging like you did. And um, some other questions that could be brought up is her also discussing the need for reconstruction. But similarly, in the setting of inflammatory, we often wait. So excellent job. And um, we'll move on with the rest of the cases. All right, perfect. Thanks so much. That was excellent. So next, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Aaron Dawes for our colorectal portion. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at Stanford University, specializing in colorectal surgery. He completed his general surgery residency at the University of California in Los Angeles, followed by fellowship in colon and rectal surgery at the University of Minnesota. He will be examining Dr. Kirby Yelorda, who is a surgery chief resident also at Stanford University, applying this year for fellowship programs in colon and rectal surgery. Dr. Dawes, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining Dr. Yawarda. We're just going to talk about a patient. We just want to see how you would manage uh, this patient in this situation. So you're on call for your practice. A 68-year-old male comes to the emergency room with abdominal pain for the past three weeks. He's had similar episodes in the past, but he thinks that this is the worst one that he can remember. He doesn't really feel like eating. He's had some mild nausea without vomiting. He doesn't report any fever or chills at home. His past medical history is significant just for hypertension and hypothyroidism that are treated with medication. He had a right knee operation, but has never had abdominal surgery or a colonoscopy. He's a current half-pack-per-day smoker. He drinks three beers per week. He has no family history of colorectal cancer, polyps, or inflammatory bowel disease. So how would you like to proceed in managing him? Uh, first, I would go see the patient in the emergency department, make sure we have a recent set of vitals, and I would do a focused abdominal exam. Okay. You go and see him downstairs. His temperature is 38.3. His blood pressure is 136 over 84. It's mildly tachycardic, 105 beats per minute. He's setting 98% on room air. His BMI is 33.6. His heart and lung exam is clear. His abdominal exam shows some tenderness to palpation in the left lower quadrant with mild rebound and focal guarding. The upper abdomen, however, is benign. There's no rebound or guarding. So tell me, um, what would you like to do next? Uh, at this point, I'd probably give him a liter of fluid and I'd get a set of labs, including a CBC, a CMP, and a lactate. Okay. So um, you get a CBC. His white blood cell count is 14,000. His hemoglobin is 12.6. 
Cleveland County is 378,000. His CMP is normal, including a creatinine of 0 0.7. His lactate is 1.5. The upper limit of normal at this institution is two. Uh, next, I'd like to get a CT of his abdomen and pelvis with IV contrasts. Okay. So um, that shows inflammation within the sigmoid colon, as well as a microperforation and an associated pericolic phlegmon. They are calling some free air that's tracking into the upper abdomen as well. So tell me, what's on your differential diagnosis for this patient at this time? So the thing I'm most concerned about is perforated diverticulitis. Um, cancer is also on my differential, as well as IPD. Okay. Um, how would you plan to treat this patient? Um, well, at this point, I'd like to recheck his vitals, and I'd like to know if he responded to the food that he got. Okay. His heart rate's now down into the 90s. He's feeling a little bit more comfortable than when you initially examined him. Okay. Um, then I would admit him. I'd make him NPO, put him on some maintenance fluids, and I'd start IV antibiotics. Okay. Um, so let me change the scenario on you just a little bit. So say um, he didn't improve with the bolus. Um, now he's developing more generalized peritonitis, um, and he's tachycardic into the 120s. Well, now he is peritonitic and has hemodynamic instability, so I would take him to the operating room um, for a sigmoid colectomy and Hartman's. Okay, let's go back to the first patient. So you've admitted him to the hospital. He actually is doing quite well. Um, get some IV antibiotics. You convert him over to oral antibiotics, advance his diet, um, and he does well and actually goes home. You see him back in clinic a couple of weeks later um, to follow up on his hospitalization. Um, as you start to talk to him, he tells you this is the fourth episode that he's had that he can now attribute to this type of symptom. He feels that his symptoms are becoming slightly more frequent, and he's worried about having future episodes. So how, number one, what kind of diverticulitis would you say he has, at least based on what you've seen of his history? Uh, and then how would you decide um, how to manage this patient operatively or not? Okay, so he has recurrent and complicated, and complicated diverticulitis. Um, you know, it's reasonable to offer him a sigmoid, an elective sigmoid colectomy, but we really need to have a conversation and share decision making. Um, I'd want to know how this affects his quality of life, how much pain he's in, um, and how much time he's having to take off of work. Okay, so you have that discussion with him. Um, he, again, feels that this is getting more frequent. He's becoming worried about it, and he's taking more time off of work. Um, you have the discussion with him, and, and he feels it would be in his interest to proceed with an elective operation. Is there anything that you'd want to do before operating on the patient? Um, yeah, so you mentioned that he smoked a half pack per day, so we would definitely need to talk about smoking cessation before an elective operation, and then he needs a colonoscopy um, six weeks from his most recent flare. Okay, and what are you looking for with the colonoscopy? Um, just trying to rule out malignancy. Okay, so um, he's willing to go into a smoking cessation program. You, you get him an outpatient colonoscopy, which shows some diverticular disease, but no polyps and no cancer. So he's here today for his uh, elective operation. Walk me through um, what operation would you do for him and, and walk me through it. Okay, so I would offer him a hand-assisted laparoscopic sigmoid colectomy. Um, I'd start with a lower midline incision for my hand port. I'd have one camera port and two working ports. Um, I would start by incising the medial leaf of the sigmoid mesentery and separate the sigmoid colon mesentery from the retroperitoneum. Uh, next, I would identify the ureter and ensure that it is protected prior to taking the IMA. Uh, next, I would take the IMA. My proximal resection margin would be healthy, pliable colon outside of the high pressure zone, and the distal resection margin would be the proximal rectum. Um, Next, I would perform a side-to-end colorectal anastomosis with an EEA stapler, and then I would perform a leak test. Okay. Would you plan to divert him prophylactically? In this case, no, I would not. Okay. So um, everything goes really well in the operating room. Um, he's recovering well the first couple of days. Um, a little bit slow um, to wake up in terms of his intestines. Hasn't really passed gas or had a bowel movement. And now post-operative day four, um, develops some fevers again, 38.3, um, 38.4, uh, is tachycardic into the one teens, uh, and most significantly starts to have some nausea and vomiting. Um, how would you like to manage him at this point? Um, I'd give him a liter bolus and I obtain a set of labs, including a CBC, a CMP, and a lactate again. Okay, so his white blood cell count is now 18,000, his creatinine is slightly elevated at 1.2, and his lactate is elevated at 2.5. Okay, I would start IV antibiotics, and then I would obtain a CT abdomen pelvis with both IV and rectal contrast. And what are you looking for? What are you concerned about with that? I'm concerned about an asthmatic leak. 
Okay, so you you get your uh, CT abdomen pelvis with IV and rectal contrast. Unfortunately, it does show a, a leak at the anastomosis with a pelvic abscess and some contrast uh, and air tracking into the upper abdomen. How would you plan to manage this patient? Well, he's tachycardic um, and pretty tender, so I would probably I would take him to the operating room for a washout and diversion. Okay, how would you plan to divert him? Um, so I would laparoscopically wash him out. Um, I'd wash out the pelvis and I would leave a drain in the pelvis and then I would do, do a diverting loop ileostomy. Okay, terrific, thanks. Um, yeah, I think you did a great job. Um, you know, I think uh, managing complications is something that others have mentioned that comes up on these exams a, a lot. Um, I, I think that the major goal of these exams is to really understand your thinking. And so um, we want to uh, be sure that people aren't going to do things as they graduate and go off on their own that wouldn't be safe or wouldn't be prudent. So I, I think it, you, great progression. I think your cadence was good. I think you, um, I agree with the comment earlier for answering the questions specifically. I think you did a good job of that and kind of allowing the exam to progress. You don't really know where it's going to go. They could take you in a totally different direction. And so you want to really be sure you're answering the questions that they're prepared because that's where you're going to get your points. That's where you're going to pass. I think it was a really, really good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very well done. Um, we will go on to our next case in pediatric surgery. And our examiner for this case is Dr. David Orhunsky, who is an assistant professor of surgery and pediatric surgeon at the University of Kentucky and Kentucky Children's Hospital. He completed his general surgery residency at Stanford, followed by pediatric surgery fellowship at Yale. He will be examining Dr. Saurav Bose, who is a general surgery chief resident at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and who will start his pediatric surgery fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital next year. Dr. Orhunsky, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Saurav. Uh, so, uh, your case, uh, you're called by an emergency medicine physician to evaluate a three week old term infant who's had three days of worsening emesis. She tells you that she's quite worried about him because he appears quite lethargic and dehydrated. Okay. Um, I'd head to the emergency room and I hope to meet the parents, uh, and get a focused history, uh, starting with, uh, understanding of onset of emesis, periodicity, the nature, whether it's been bilious or not, a projectile or not any associated symptoms, including fever, uh, diarrhea, blood per rectum, and distension. So you go and uh, you meet the family um, and they tell you that it's been happening for about three days. It has been increasingly uh, uh, forceful and they even uh, say, yeah, it has been projectile. They describe it as non-bilious. It looks just like the, the milk he's taken. Um, no blood per rectum, uh, no fevers, uh, nothing else to report. Okay. Uh, you did mention milk. So uh, I, I'd want to clarify the baby's feeding history, whether it was uh, a normal progression, whether milk or formula fed, and if he has a history of spit up. Yeah. So he's been breastfed since birth. They did try formula yesterday because they were uh, sort of at wit's end with uh, trying to manage his emesis, um, but it really hasn't resulted in any change. Okay. Um, I also want to clarify the baby's birth history, term, preterm, any pregnancy complications. Uh, whether the child was first born or if there were any family history of any GI issues? Uh, no no uh, significant birth, uh, prenatal history uh, or family history. Okay, so it sounds, a, like, a firstborn. it sounds like- It sounds like, see, he was a firstborn? He's a, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like we have a neonate who has a couple days of non-bilious emesis, um, firstborn with no relevant family history. Uh, I would move on to an examination, uh, focusing on the patient's vital signs, uh, evaluate their fontanelles, uh, skin quality, and examine the abdomen looking for palpable masses and distension. So, uh, so you evaluate the patient, uh, vital signs are all normal for age. On exam, uh, he does have dry mucous membranes, um, and his fontanelle is slightly sunken, his skin turgor is decreased, his abdomen is flat, soft, non-tender throughout, and you can't palpate any mass because he's crying throughout. Okay. Um, so for this patient, uh, my next steps would be resuscitation, but uh, my differential would uh, be topped with uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Uh, I'd also consider GERD, gastroenteritis, uh, an infection of other sort, um, or a central cause of emesis. But given that he's firstborn, uh, hasn't had any feeding issues, and now has projectile emesis uh, with what looks like dehydration, um, pyloric stenosis uh, seems to make sense to me. I would get a BMP and a CBC to further evaluate. 
So CBC is pretty unremarkable, high normal hemoglobin, uh, but is otherwise normal. BMP shows a potassium 2.5, chloride is 82, and your bicarb is 44. Okay, so that uh, drives me away from an infectious source, uh, given a normal white count. Uh, the hematocrit concentrated, the BMP notable for hypochloremia, hypokalemia, uh, with a metabolic alkalosis, which is uh, pretty characteristic of uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So that's my main differential, and I would get an ultrasound focused on the pylorus. They do an ultrasound. It shows an elongated and thickened pylorus. It measures 18 millimeters long and four millimeters thick. Uh, the radiologist comments that they don't see any gastric contents traversing the pyloric channel. Okay. Uh, so that in my head is consistent uh, with the proposed diagnosis. Uh, I would admit the patient to the hospital and uh, begin with a bolus of normal saline, uh, 20 cc's per kilogram, uh, up to three times and then consider maintenance fluids at one and a half times with uh, D5 half normal saline with potassium with a goal to bring this child to uh, appropriate resuscitation. Um, I would check the labs again in a few, four to six hours to see where uh, the, in particular, the BMP lands. And what are you looking for in the BMP? Yeah, so uh, heading towards normalization uh, with a goal of chloride over 100 and uh, CO2 that's uh, normalizing less than 30. And when, when did you say you want to recheck the labs? Uh, four to six hours. Okay. So you check after four hours and repeat labs show a uh, chloride is 90 and your bicarb is 35. Okay. Um, so I would continue resuscitation uh, and check again in two to four hours. Okay. Say four uh, hours. <laughs> you decide to let the baby sleep uh, a little yeah. bit. And you recheck in the morning and now your labs show a chloride of 102 and a bicarb of 37. My carb of 37. Okay. I would, uh, sorry, I'm 27. Sorry. 27. Okay. So now I think this baby is appropriate for going to the operating room and I would, uh, plan for laparoscopic pyloromyotomy. I'd speak to the parents about this and book the case. Okay. Uh, give me a, a general approach to, uh, laparoscopic pyloromyotomy. Sure. So after uh, induction of anesthesia, uh, we place an OG tube to decompress the stomach. Uh, I do a varus entry uh, in the sub umbilical position uh, using three millimeter port. Uh, I place two additional upper abdominal three millimeter ports, identify the pylorus, uh, uh, retract the stomach up, uh, use a coated bogey to uh, transect the serosa over the pylorus uh, and the circular muscle. I'd uh, go up to a couple millimeters proximal to uh, the pylorus duodenal junction. Uh, considering the vein of mayo and skin cha or, uh, tissue changes there. Uh, and then I would uh, uh, get through the circular muscle and then use a laparoscopic dissector to spread that muscle until the submucosa were to bulge out. Um, at that point, I would uh, ask anesthesia to instill some air through the uh, OG tube to do a leak test uh, and then close the patient uh, and admit them to the ward for apnea monitoring. Let's say you're uh, doing the pylor myotomy and you notice some uh, bile draining from your myotomy. Yeah, so I'd be concerned that I went uh, too deep and I would close that myotomy and uh, go to the other side of the pylorus and do a new myotomy. How would you do? Would you do that laparoscopically or convert? Uh, laparoscopically. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of scenario uh, quickly. Let's say during your workup, mom shows you a picture of the emesis and it's green. Okay, I'd be concerned of bilious emesis, uh, which changes the uh, nature of the situation. Is the child hemodynamically stable? Uh, child is stable. Okay, so instead of an ultrasound, I would get the same labs and initial evaluation, and then I take the patient to radiology for an upper GI uh, with concern for malrotation uh, with, with or without volvulus or an atresia. And if you showed malrotation without volvulus? Uh, I would plan to go to the operating room to uh, manage the malrotation. What operation would you do? Uh, at the end of what is a LADS procedure, uh, plus minus any bowel resection for any compromised bowel, uh, plus minus detorsion of any volvuli segment. Great. All right, I think our time is up. Uh, I thought you did a wonderful job. Uh, good cadence. Uh, you got through the scenario. Um, you know, the description of the laparoscopic pyloromyotomy maybe went on a little bit too long. You can probably shorten it and just go briefly. Um, and uh, really nitpicky. I don't think you'd have to know this for general surgery boards, but we don't use half normal saline in kids, only uh, normal saline. So D5 normal saline is our maintenance fluid, but that you need to know that for peed surgery, not for uh, in, in a few years later. Oh, but years. <laughs> but I, th I thought you did a great job.
Perfect. Thank you both so much. That was excellent. So next, we're going to move on to vascular surgery, and I will introduce Dr. David Strasberg. He's an assistant professor of surgery in the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the Yale New Haven Hospital. He completed his general surgery residency at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where he served as the administrative chief resident before completing a vascular surgery fellowship at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He will be examining Dr. Nathan Massel, who is a PGY-5 general surgery chief resident at Yale, slated to begin his pediatric surgery fellowship next fall at Emory. Dr. Strasberg, take it away. Uh, welcome, Dr. Massel. Um, so let's start with a 65-year-old male who presents to your office as a referral for an asymptomatic 5.6 centimeter infernal aneurysm, which was identified on the screening duplex by his primary care physician. He tells you that he has no abdominal pain, no back pain. He does have a uh, history of two block claudication, uh, which affects both of his lower extremities, uh, um, primarily his calves. Uh, he has no rest pain, no tissue loss. Um, he does have a history of a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy eight years ago for stage one colon cancer. Um, he takes no medications. He smokes one pack per day. Um, family history is notable uh, as his father uh, passed away from a ruptured AAA uh, at age 60. Uh, on exam, he's comfortable. Uh, his respirations are unlabored. Uh, he's uh, uh, without tachycardia. Uh, he does have a pulsatile abdominal mass. Uh, he does have palpable femoral pulses. Um, you have difficulty obtaining uh, pedal pulses, but he does have multiphasic signals uh, from your continuous handheld Doppler. How would you like to proceed? Great. Um, so uh, it sounds like I have a pretty thorough um, history and physical uh, examination already. Um, we have an ultrasound of a, a 5.6 centimeter um, abdominal aortic aneurysm, um, which would meet criteria for um, uh, repair. Uh, and he has a history of uh, colonic surgery as well. So um, I would uh, proceed with uh, performing a, a CTA and discuss with the patient that I'd like to repair his um, aneurysm. Okay. Um, so you get your CTA. Uh, it shows a uh, 5.6 fusiform uh, infernal aneurysm. Um, it does not have any iliac involvement. Is okay. there anything else you're looking for in the CT scan? Um, I'm looking at the distance from the um, uh, renal vessels to see if I have um, adequate uh, space to clamp or um, if I were to refer him to a vascular surgeon for um, an endovascular uh, approach. Um, uh, and then, yeah, the distal landing zones, as you said, there's no um, aneurysm. So I just want to make th sure that the vessels were appropriately sized. Um, and uh, he has a history of um, claudication as well. I would ask for a uh, runoff with the uh, exam too, just to examine um, his uh, distal vasculature. Okay. Um, so he does have approximately a uh, um, two centimeter inferenal aortic neck um, that appears uh, disease free. Um, he does have uh, um, tortuous, but uh, otherwise uh, disease-free um, common iliac arteries. Um, his uh, CTA with runoff uh, demonstrates uh, diffuse uh, uh, SFA disease um, uh, with uh, a patent palpatial and, uh, and tibial vessels. Okay. Um, I, would, uh, I would have examined his um, palpatials uh, in the office as well, just because there's an increased risk of um, palpatial aneurysms and um, given his SFA disease um, and inferring inguinal disease, I would um, uh, counsel him that he was a better candidate for an open um, abdominal aortic aneurysm um, repair. Um, I would have him undergo uh, medical and uh, cardiac clearance um, and get uh, preoperative uh, lab workup and then discuss taking him to the operating room for an open uh, AAA repair. Okay, um, so you go ahead and do that. Um, you uh, encourage smoking cessation as well. Um, you start him on uh, uh, an antiplatelet and statin. Uh, he sees his cardiologist. Uh, he gets a preoperative echo. Um, he has uh, an EF of 65%. Uh, he has uh, grade one diastolic dysfunction, um, but otherwise uh, it's otherwise uh, unremarkable. Um, so he's uh, otherwise optimized to go. So what would you like to do? Okay, um, I'd like to do a, a transabdominal approach. Um, so I would uh, um, prepare the patient, have him supine, you know, discuss with anesthesia that we would uh, have all the appropriate uh, blood products on hold um, for the procedure, um, get an A-line and uh, um, uh, central line for the patient and then proceed with a laparotomy after prepping 
um, from the nipple to knees and uh, um, uh, retract the small bowel to the right, uh, lift the um, transverse colon uh, upwards, and then uh, begin my dissection on the aorta um, at the ligament of trites um, coming down on the duodenum to expose the aorta um, and obtain uh, um, space for proximal control of the aorta, and then also dissect out both uh, common iliac arteries. Um, prior to uh, um, clamping, I would heparinize the patient with 80 units per kilogram um, of heparin and check every 20 minutes to ensure that I had an ACT of um, at least 200. Um, throughout the case, um, I would uh, clamp um, uh, beneath uh, the uh, renal vessels um, proximally and then uh, both iliac vessels um, and then uh, resect um, the aneurysm sac and uh, place a tube, tube graft, which I would sew in with um, 2 -O proline, um, ensuring to ligate all uh, relevant lumbars along the sides, and then close the peritoneum back over top of my repair um, and complete the case with uh, ensuring that I had uh, distal pedal pulses um, uh, or the same pulse exam as uh, prior. Um, okay, um, so close. everything goes well. Um, so uh, he goes to recovery. Um, he's making urine. Um, his uh, his post-op labs are unremarkable. Um, on post-op day two uh, in the ICU, uh, you get a call that he has left lower quadrant pain. Um, you go see him. Uh, he's got a fever um, to uh, 102 Fahrenheit. Um, he's tachycardic uh, to 110. His blood pressure is uh, is uh, 110 over 70. Um, and uh, he's setting uh, appropriately on, on two liters of oxygen. Okay. Uh, well, making sure that he's appropriately resuscitated, I'd be worried about uh, his um, prior history of uh, colonic surgery and that uh, I had not appropriately assessed um, his uh, IMA for um, back bleeding or stump pressures. Um, and I would talk with uh, the gastroenterology um, team about uh, doing a, a scope to confirm my suspicion of colonic ischemia. Um, for this patient, um, I would I would get a CT scan first, um, and then um, proceed with a GI to scope the patient. Okay, um, so you get your CT scan. Um, uh, it, it shows that your uh, aortic repair is intact. Um, there is uh, uh, what appears to be um, uh, edema of his uh, left colon, sigmoid colon. Um, you do get a sigmoidoscopy, um, which uh, demonstrates um, mucosal sloughing. Um, Petechial uh, 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 hemorrhaging, um, fragile mucosa, uh, and he also has areas of segmental erythema and scattered erosions. All right. Um, so I would uh, return to the operating room and uh, plan to do a, um, a left hemicolectomy and uh, a Hartman's procedure. I would give him a, an endclostomy. Okay, uh, so I guess time is up. Um, so Dr. Massel, I thought you did wonderful. This was a really hard case. I think it's a fairly common case um, that you may see on your certifying exam. Um, I thought you're, uh, um, you're very well-spoken. Um, I, I thought that uh, your description of the uh, repair was excellent. Um, just going at the beginning, um, I would just, uh, um, uh, don't forget the basics, um, the smoking cessation, aspirin, statin. Um, you, you, you did the screening for the pop aneurysms. That was great. Um, your, uh, you recognize that there were uh, two options, the open versus the EVAR. Um, I thought your description of an open repair was excellent. Um, and you heparinized. I think everyone forgets to heparinize. So you did, you did well with that. Um, I would just uh, uh, mention what you clamp first, uh, clamp the iliacs first, so that way you don't trash down distally when you clamp that aortic neck. Um, and uh, the other, only other point is uh, typically we keep the aneurysm sac and we, we reapproximate over the, the bypass graft. Um, and so that provides an additional buffer uh, between the uh, uh, retroperitoneum and the, and the duodenum uh, to prevent any uh, uh, future uh, uh, aortoenteric fistula. Um, you recognize that the patient uh, um, needed to have their IMA um, uh, interrogated uh, with that right hemicolectomy. So he's uh, really dependent on that IMA. And, uh, and so that was a very quick pickup and, and you did the right thing. Um, I would just also start antibiotics as well um, in addition, but uh, that was great. Nice job.
Awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, listening to that case kind of took me back to when I was on vascular as a resident. And I can only say that I'm glad that period of my life is over. So thank you, Dr. Strasberg, for everything that you do. Um, so last but certainly not least is trauma and critical care. So our examiner for this section is Dr. Ali Akazi, who is an assistant professor of surgery at the University of California, Irvine specializing in trauma and acute care surgery. She completed her general surgery residency at UC Irvine in a surgical critical care fellowship at Stanford. She will be examining Dr. Morgan Manassa, who is a general surgery chief resident also at UC Irvine, and who will be starting her minimally invasive surgery fellowship at UCSF next year. Dr. Kazi. Hi, Dr. Manassa. Um, so you are the trauma physician on call and you're called to the emergency department to evaluate a 28 year old man with no medical history who was brought in by EMS after a motorcycle collision. He was wearing a helmet, denies any loss of consciousness. He has pain to the left side of his body. His vitals on arrival are a heart rate of 112, a blood pressure of 110 over 82, respiratory rate of 22, and he is saturating at 94% on room air. How would you like to proceed? Thank you. Um, I'd start by assessing the patient's airway, breathing, circulation, as well as disability per my ATLS guidelines. I'd want to complete a primary survey um, while also closely communicating my team to place two large bore IVs um, and send routine lab work, including type and cross, um, CBC, CMP. And I'd also like to add some adjuncts during my primary survey, including a FAST exam, as well as a chest X-ray and pelvic X-ray. Okay. Um, your airway, breathing, and circulation are all intact. Um, on primary and secondary survey, uh, the only findings are left chest wall and left abdominal tenderness um, and road rash abrasions to the entire uh, left side of the patient's body. Uh, your EFAST is negative and your chest X-ray and pelvic X-ray are overall normal. What's your next step in management? Okay. Given the patient's uh, mechanism with signs of traumatic injuries along the chest and abdomen and reassuring vital signs, I proceed with getting CT imaging. I'd like to get CT scans of the head, the C-spine, chest, as well as abdomen pelvis with IV contrast. Okay. Um, on your CT scans, uh, the radiology, radiologist reports a grade three splenic laceration um, with surrounding perisplenic hematoma and small volume hemoperitoneum. There are no other traumatic injuries identified. How would you manage this patient? So given the patient is not peritonitic and his vital signs remain stable, I'd monitor him in a close setting in the intensive care unit. I would trend hemoglobins every six hours, as well as perform serial abdominal exams and keep the patient NPO. Okay. Um, the patient is admitted to the ICU approximately 12 hours into the admission. Um, the patient continues to have left chest and left abdominal pain. His heart rate is um, in the 120s. The systolic blood pressure is in the 90s. His hemoglobin has gone from 14 to 10. He is transfused one unit of packed red blood cells and one of FFP. And afterwards, his heart rate is in the 100s and his systolic blood pressure is in the 1 teens. How would you counsel the patient? So I'd immediately go bedside and discuss with the patient my concern um, about um, potentially having worsening bleeding due to the splenic injury. I'd recommend getting a CTA at that time of the abdomen and pelvis um, to see if any interventional radiology was required. Okay. You obtain a CTA and let me know if you can see the image. Um, can you interpret this image for me and let me know what you're seeing? Of course. So I can see a splenic injury as previously noted. However, now there is a contrast blush um, concerning for active bleed. There's also some um, fluid density and hemoperitoneum around the spleen. Okay, excellent. So uh, what would you like to do now? So I'd reassess the patient, make sure as long as they remain hemodynamically stable, I would consult interventional radiology for um, angiography and possible embolization given the grade three splenic, but now with active extravasation. Yes, yeah, so your patient's vital signs are stable. Um, he goes to the IR suite where an angiography reveals active extravasation 
of the upper pole and a selective coil embolization is performed. Um, the following day, um, while the patient is in the ICU, he's found to be tachycardic again to the 120s and a systolic blood pressure of the 90s. He receives an additional two units of packed red blood cells and two units of FFP, but his vitals remain the same. How would you like to proceed now? So given the patient has not uh, improved his vital signs after resuscitation, he remains unstable, I would activate the massive transfusion protocol while also booking the patient emergently for the operating room. Uh, and I would counsel the patient on needing an exploratory laparotomy and, and splenectomy, most likely given my findings. Okay. Can you describe your operation to me? Of course. So I'd um, begin with an exploratory laparotomy. I'd make sure to prep the patient from the neck to bilateral thighs. I'd perform exploratory laparotomy with packing of all four quadrants, but I'd start in the left upper quadrant given the patient's known splenic injury. I'd have close communication with my anesthesia colleagues to allow time to catch up with their resuscitation and massive transfusion protocol. Um, next, I would begin mobilizing the spleen medially. I would take down all of its ligaments and attachments while dividing the short gastrics. And then I would isolate the splenic hilum and, and dissect that with a vascular load stapler. Um, and then I would close the patient and return to the ICU for close monitoring. Your patient does well postoperatively. Um, and then on post-op day four, he starts to report increased abdominal pain. On exam, there's focal tenderness in the left upper quadrant, but no peritonitis. Um, his vital signs are a temperature of 38.9, uh, heart rate in the one teens, systolic blood pressure in the one teens. His white blood cell count is 14,000. His labs are otherwise normal. Um, what is your differential diagnosis at this point? So given his recent surgery and splenectomy, I'm concerned about either um, an abscess formation in the left upper quadrant or possibly a pancreatic leak. Um, so I would want to start antibiotics as well as, you know, keep the patient NPO fluid resuscitate and obtain a CT scan with IV um, contrast. Your CT scan shows a six centimeter fluid collection near the tail of the pancreas. The patient undergoes percutaneous drain placement. Um, with amylase levels consistent with a pancreatic leave. He, his symptoms improve and he is discharged, planned for discharge on hospital day five. Um, is there anything else you would like to recommend on the patient's management? I uh, make sure the patient has close follow-up in the trauma surgery clinic. I'd also want to make sure he, we administer post splenectomy vaccines prior to discharge, um, including Haemophilus pneumococcus and meningococcus. Excellent. Um, right on time. Uh, Morgan, I think you did extremely well um, with the scenario. Uh, I think your pace is good. Um, you were very thorough, but also succinct. Um, I I think you did a great job on, on this. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask if any of the audience members have questions for our panelists, uh, please put them in the Q&A and I can help kind of address them one by one. But I want to start by just giving a round of applause for all of our examiners and examinees that did a phenomenal job preparing for and administering these scenarios. Um, I want the audience to keep in mind that the examinees knew which specialty they would be tested in. So please don't feel intimidated by seeing the phenomenal performances that everyone did today. It is certainly more challenging to prepare for all of general surgery boards and you will be able to do it. But I wanna thank everyone for their hard work in putting everything together today. Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to trickle into the q and A, I I just wanna ask a couple of questions if we have our faculty still here. And I wanna start with Dr. Dawes. One question that I've noticed in terms of my own personal prep for the oral boards as well is just when you're asked about scoping patients in particular colonoscopy for a situation where a patient may be presenting with uh, findings concerning for a volvulus, you know, in real life, we would often ask for our GI colleagues to do so. And I'm just wondering in your experience and perspective in answering these questions, is there a go-to way of voicing so in the exam in terms of I would have my GI colleagues do it or I would feel comfortable doing this from the get-go and how you'd address that? Yeah, so I think the only danger there is, remember, the board has a list of procedures that you need to know how to describe. I haven't looked at it in a while. I would be curious of whether colonoscopy is on the required procedures. So I think it would be fair to say, 
you know, like this is how I, I've done it. This is how I would describe doing the procedure. Um, but that, you know, I, I would, you know, defer this to my GI colleagues if they were available. I just wouldn't say that you don't know how to do something that might be on the required list because that could be a problem. That's fair. Um, and colonoscopy and endoscopy are on the required list since the fundamentals of endoscopic surgery was introduced into the required curriculum for general surgery. Perfect. But, but again, the procedure for doing a colonoscopy in terms of what you need to describe is relatively straightforward, right? So, I mean, I don't think you need to get into all, you know, it's not for general surgery boards that you're talking about maneuvers in order to try to get further in or better control. You're basically going to just describe, you know, safely inserting the colonoscope, um, trying to reduce loops, potentially going around, um, you know, corners and those sorts of things. So I don't think that you get to the level of concern that anyone that hadn't seen a couple colonoscopies couldn't describe what to do. And just out of curiosity, they sometimes will ask for maneuvers if you're having trouble navigating a certain portion of the colon. Are there any key maneuvers that you would suggest to keep in mind to discuss yeah. that? So um, what, what people call abdominal support, which is just putting pressure on the abdomen, um, is certainly uh, one of the easiest kind of go-to maneuvers. You can ask the patient, him or herself, to kind of move, depending on the level of sedation, or you can move the patient onto his or her back, or uh, even sometimes into the full prone position in order to get some support and go around, um, those sorts of things. Depending on why you're not progressing, you can change the size of the scope. Um, you know, if you're having trouble navigating a narrowed area. Perfect. So one of the questions I'm seeing in the chat, one I can point to Dr. Strasberg to help with is for scenarios like uh, AAA, should we say that we would attempt to consult or transfer to an appropriate specialty service? So for example, if you're the general surgery consult resident or attending, and then this seems to be a vascular problem, how would you sort of address that? Oh, I think it's a good question. I think uh, for, for these scenarios that um, you are expected to know how to describe an open AAA repair and know how to recognize um, ischemic colitis and the appropriate operation as a general surgery um, uh, resident. Um, I, I think that uh, as Dr. Massel had alluded to about um, asking um, some of the criteria for an endovascular repair, if you feel comfortable explaining it, I think that's fair in 2023, but I think that they're going to give you a scenario where you can't. They, they may say the wire may not advance or your catheter may not advance or um, the device is not available or something like that. So um, while, while you may be able to, uh, um, to describe it, it's not on the required list. And so I think that they would um, make you do an open repair. Okay. Um, question I have for Dr. Kazi, I think one of the things that pops up sometimes are knowing the dosages for certain drugs that you would give, especially if you were to induce a patient for intubation or if you had to provide pressors for a patient in a critical care scenario. Do you have any guidance about any medications in particular that are very high yield for the critical care and trauma portion to be aware of and have in the back of your hand? Yeah, um, I actually, I don't, is that, are they asking doses for medications? I know, I think RSI may have, is I believe one of the things on the category. So it's good to know ahead of time that I would be able to just like your operations have a very quick, like just less than 30 second blurb of the steps for a rapid sequence intubation and just say which medications you would use. Um, I don't recall, I don't think that, I hope they're not asking you guys for doses using medication. I, I think I've, which medications you would use. Have you heard of anyone being asked about a dose? So for, I've heard for sedation, for example, granted, these are just hearsay. So you don't know if these are things that are marked against or just you've done so well that you've gotten to the point that I'm going to ask extra things. So it's not entirely clear, but um, I've been taught in the past that induction meds are necessary to know. Sedation for folks getting an EGD or a colonoscopy are good to know as well. Uh, Dr. Strasberg alluded to the heparin as well, like knowing the dose of heparin to give 80 units per kilograms essential for uh, an embolectomy, for example. For, for the heparin, I would definitely know the dose. And I would know, I think, as long as you know your, your medications for induction, um, if you want to remember medications for sedation, I think I'd be surprised if they're asking for that. So I think that the main, they, they really are trying to get you to progress through the steps. And generally the whole point of this is, I feel like the exam is very fair and they're trying to test your general knowledge and make sure that you're a safe surgeon. Um, and 
even if they were to ask little questions like that and say you don't remember the dose of a medication, don't get hung up on it. They don't want to waste time on something small like that. They will move the question along. Um, and I'm not seeing many other questions being posted in, but there was one that was more of a general question for all of our examiners. So if any of our examiners are still here, if you can turn your video on, I'll just kind of go from person to person that's still here and ask you this to kind of close out for our session. And I'll start with Dr. Day. Um, for the scenario that you presented, and the question will be the same for everyone, what would be some critical fails if people said or omitted from saying for that scenario that would have caused them to fail? I'm starting with Dr. Day. Uh, so for instance, uh, in my scenario, getting to the wrong diagnosis or doing the wrong operation, uh, like if uh, you didn't do a pH workup and uh, some sort of esophageal uh, workup beforehand that could end up with a, a critical fail as you didn't have a complete workup before going to surgery. Uh, the focus generally in all the scenarios are going to be on what is safe and not safe to do. Uh, so the critical fails are really when you take an unsafe maneuver. Uh, you can do wrong things in almost any scenario, and it may lead you down a pathway, uh, but it won't necessarily be that critical fail. Great. Dr. Gull, can you give us two or three critical fails for the scenario you presented? Yeah. So for inflammatory breast cancer, I think a, um, a critical fail would be doing a lumpectomy. So in a, in a case with a very aggressive breast cancer, doing anything um, beyond a modified radical it's still the standard of care. And so I think if the examiner is pushing you and saying there's a complete clinical response, et cetera, stick to your guns and still do the safe surgery, which is a modified radical. And similarly, I wouldn't get, um, I wouldn't go down a rabbit hole of trying to do um, a targeted ax dissection or anything. The, the standard of care is still a modified radical mastectomy. And so similarly, in this case, um, in addition, you want to get to the right diagnosis. So you don't want to treat them continuously with antibiotics for um, a breast abscess, but that's kind of how the case might start as a breast abscess, but quickly jump to um, um, an oncologic diagnosis is, is probably where they're going. Okay. Dr. Warhunsky, you have two or three critical fails for the scenario you shared. Yeah, I think um, for for the pyloric stenosis scenario, obviously not. I, I think the initial step of of diagnosing non bilious versus bilious emesis, uh, the scenario is built so that you'll either get you'll get one or the other. And bilious emesis in a newborn or an infant is a surgical emergency to proven otherwise to rule out mid gut ovulus. Non bilious, you want to go down the route of pyloric stenosis. Um, and so distinguishing those two. And then if you have pyloric stenosis, I think probably a critical fail if you take the kid to the operating room before you've resuscitated, right? This is a medical problem, initially not a surgical problem. All right, we only have two more minutes left. So I'll go next to Dr. Kazi if you've got one or two critical fails for your scenario. Yeah, for this, I'd keep in mind just the same for all trauma scenarios, always focus on your A, B, and Cs. And then if the patient is sta stable or unstable is really what should guide you. So if in this case, the patient was stable, but if they were unstable, getting a CT scan or trying to go to IR um, would definitely be a fail. So always try to, um, you know, base that and the trauma questions based, you know, on the patient's hemodynamic stability is going to take you to the OR or elsewhere. Okay. Dr. Das? Yeah, I would agree with that. So, you know, the, the version where you have a patient who's hemodynamic and unstable and, and has peritoneal findings you take that patient to the operating room. So not doing that or trying to do something short of that would be a critical fail. Um, I think most of the people get in trouble when they try to get a little out over their skis uh, and try to talk about things they want the uh, they want the examiner to know they know something. And so I think just answering the question, staying within the kind of realm of that is the safest way to proceed um, and just making safe decisions. There's no, nothing wrong with making an open incision. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing things safely. Um, that's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear that you just read some, you know, new paper where they're doing something robotically up in this, that, and the other. So just safe surgery, general progression. All right. And then lastly, Dr. Strasberg, if you can close us out. 
Sure, I would just say um, just recognizing uh, that a 5.6 centimeter aneurysm uh, should get an operation if they're physically fit and um, being able to describe an open aneurysm repair and just recognizing the complication, whether the um, treatment is antibiotics and observation or it's OR, um, as long as you recognize that there will be a complication uh, in these scenarios and, and uh, knowing a, a strategy to, to manage. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again to our examiners and our examinee. This was an excellent session. And thank you to all of our attendees. If you didn't join or uh, for the whole thing or you want to see a recording of this in the future, we will have this up online to view by the end of this week. So keep an eye out on the SSAT website, free to access for anyone, whether you are a member or not, we would encourage you to be so. Thanks so much for joining. Have a good night.